So we are live. Wonderful. Good afternoon and welcome to the audit committee meeting of the state bar. As a reminder, this meeting is recorded. Can Mr. Ewart please call the roll? Broughton? Chen? Present. Noel? Present. Shelby? Present. Tony? Present. We have a quorum. Excellent. And I see uh, Mr. Broughton, you are here as well. Yes, I am. Welcome, Mr. Broughton. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining us on this Friday. Um, and we want to, well, I'll save this for the chair's report. Let's now have the call for public comment. The State Bar staff will attempt to call members of the public in the order that they appear in the attendee pool. For those who are participating by Zoom video, you should have a function for virtually raising your hand. It is a hand icon and should appear at the bottom center of your screen. If you wish to address the committee, simply click the hand icon now and State Bar staff will call on you in that order. For those participating by phone, it is star key and then the number nine, again, star and the number nine, and the staff will um, alert us to your presence so you will be able to make a comment. Let's see, due to time constrictions, we cannot allow more than three minutes for each speaker. Please note staff will have an on-screen timer that will count down and is visible to all attendees during the duration of public comment. Again, this timer will flash on the screen. Uh, Mr. Ewert, is there anyone in public comment? Yes, there are two. Um... Justin Beck, I have un if you unmute yourself, you will have three minutes. Hi, thank you very much. I'll be less than three minutes. Um, my name is Justin S. Beck, and this is a public service announcement. I'm calling the public's attention to page 53, section 12 of the State Bar of California's draft audit for the fiscal year ending 2022. There are two pending cases in U.S. Southern District of California lying in antitrust constitutional and RICO allegations. It is a materially false statement under GAAP that they relate to disciplinary actions or that the range of material contingent liabilities are uncertain when they are specifically claimed and required to be reported. If you'd like to learn more about the nature of the claims pending against the State Bar of California, the State of California and its leadership, which have nothing to do with attorney discipline and everything to do with alleged fraud and racketeering, please, please visit stopcorruptlawyers.com. The case numbers are 322CV01616 AGS DDL and 323CV01640 AGS DDL. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beck, for your comments. Mr. Ewert, who is next? Uh, it looks like Michael Sternberg. I have unmuted your mic. If you unmute yourself, you will have three minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, committee. I spoke to the board at public uh, comment on August 25th, 2022, and I complained about the misconduct process and the bar's refusal to uh, process complaints properly or take evidence. I talked about file size limitations on the website and how that precluded evidence. And I talked about pro problems in the process, including with the complaint review unit who had been ignoring me for a year at that point when I was asking about the status of my case. As if to prove my point, the complaint review unit that same day after my public comments sent me a closeout letter, three pages long, where over and over again, they cite lack of evidence and never address the fact that they refuse to take evidence or give me an opportunity to supply evidence. So I've typed up a letter which describes the chronology of this one issue uh, and that one particular complaint. And I've typed it up and addressed it to the executive director and the board of trustees. And I've asked Louisa to circulate it to you, which she has promised she would do. Uh, with my remaining time, I just quickly wanna go into the chronology. So on that one particular complaint, it was filed on October 28th, 2021 about a lawyer who was filing different versions of motions than what he was serving on me. Melanie Dorian, who works for you in your intake unit, instantly closed out the complaint 
saying it was just a rehash of an old complaint and that I did not attach anything. That was not true. I attached a text file that says, I cannot cope with the file size limitations. I will be mailing in my evidence. Because she closed it out, I sent a certified letter return receipt requested to the complaint review unit. And I said, you are supposed to tell me how this process works for the business and professions code. And I'm asking for an investigator and for you to take evidence. They ignored me until my public comments on 825 when they closed out the complaint for lack of evidence, having never assigned an investigator, having never given me a chance to submit evidence. So my new tactic is going to be, I'm going to type up these complaints one issue at a time. I'm going to send them to the presiding judge of the Santa Clara County Superior Court and ask her to refer it to the bar. I'm then going to file it with the bar. And I'm asking that the same investigator be put on every single complaint at the bar so that a coherent timeline and investigation can be done and I can be ensured a due process and a fair process. I am going to then come to all of these meetings and a public comment, make my complaints so that there is a record. 30 seconds left. And nobody can, no institution and no people involved in this can claim plausible deniability. So uh, the last thing I want to say is I tried to file a complaint recently. The website does not work in terms of looking up the attorney you want to complain with. I brought it to Louisa's attention who called me and tried to help and I appreciated it. But why is it up to me and Louisa to solve these problems? You guys have a big problem at the bar. Uh, I've been suffering immensely because of it. This is related to an abduction of my children. And I can only imagine what's going on. Your time is up, sir. Public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sternberg, for your comments. Anyone else in public comment, Mr. Ewart? Um, Chris Black. If you would unmute yourself, you will have three minutes. Fantastic. Uh, can I be heard? Yes. yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, much like the previous speaker, uh, you know, I'm here today um, to share some of the grave concerns I have about the state bar, most notably what appears to be the hand and glove relationship with truly the most depraved of characters, um, truly the, the worst attorneys rely on the dereliction of duty of the state bar, knowing that the state bar will not take action. Uh, I myself have, uh, I myself have helped hundreds of people. No one has any success with the state bar because it appears to be nothing more than a sham organization masquerading as a consumer protection board. Uh, when it appears to, in, in reality, it's just collecting fees and then acting as a syndicate to protect the, the bad acts of the many bad attorneys in the state. I'm sure that there are good attorneys in the state. Um, I just haven't met very many of them. They're, they're, they're seemingly elusive. Um, concerns that I have, I have seen trust documents, um, meaning the trust uh, statement for a bank account, photoshopped, altered, um, that is for Moore, Schumann, Moore in San Diego. It is not for my case, but for another case, the bank statements were taken into a bank and it was verified that the logo had been altered, the document had been doctored, um, and uh, these are falsification of business records, uh, these are federal records. And of course, what do you think the state bar did? Precisely nothing. Um, you know, it's it's well understood that Tom Girardi and scoundrels like him run the state bar through bribes. Um, you know, all sorts of illicit relationships, um, both economic and sexual. It's very concerning. The people of the state of California have been nothing short of sacrificed. The uh, folks in the state bar uh, always claim that the persons suffering in the family court system are somewhat emotional or some nonsense like that to discredit them. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's just that the ultimate scoundrels have found a home there because the state bar takes no action. I personally filed a complaint against an attorney who actually assaulted a paralegal, requiring the police to be called because she did not know who had physically hurt her. Uh, 30 seconds left. Thank you. And, and what do you think the state bar did? Absolutely nothing. I put them on notice that he had falsified and padded a, a billing, sought the assistance of the court to enforce the padded billing, um, had engaged in felonious evidence manufacturing. State bar did precisely nothing. Uh, the same scoundrel, Keith Dolnick, has not returned persons unused trust funds. What do you think the state bar did? 
precisely nothing. The, the problem is, is much bigger. Thanks, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Black, for your comments. Any other public comments? Uh, John Prime. Uh, if you will unmute yourself, you will have three minutes. Yes, thank you for taking the time. Um, if she could stop eating while we're having this presentation, that'd be great. Um, so I'm writing you to express my concern regarding the reported instances of fraud in the court perpetuated by the attorneys in California, most specifically um, Gail Hickman, uh, Robert Bullock, and uh, Julie Palafox. Despite being informed numerous times, it appears the State Bar of California along with Leah T. Wilson right down here. Um, she, uh, the executive director of the California Bar Association, have failed to hold certain state actors and California bar members accountable for their conspiracy to deprive individuals of civil rights, parental rights, autonomy, and the ability to control their finances. It is concerning to learn about these countless victims of the Lemoreau Justice Center who have had their estates plundered, children trafficked, and up to unfit parents, and civil rights violated. The actions of the Orange County Superior Court supervising Judge Julie Palafox, retired OC Superior Court Commissioner Gail Hickman, and Attorney Robert Bullock, among others, should be investigated thoroughly, and the perpetrators should be held accountable for their actions. Moreover, it is concerning to learn that the Board of the Orange County Board of Supervisors, Orange County Office of Risk Assessment, and OC Superior Court CEO David Yakasami, whatever his name is, perpetuated the fraud on the court by failing to intervene to defend and stop such actions when informed such violations of 1946, the U.S. Constitution are ongoing and immediate action must be taken to prevent further harm to further victims. It's also concerning to learn that legal scholars, Chris Guthrie, Dean of Vanderbilt Law School, Albert Gonzalez of Belmont University Law School, have repeatedly refused to report the attorney of judicial misconduct of the Tennessee participants despite being required to do so by Rule 3, 8.3, that the Tennessee Group of Professional Responsibility is reporting to this uh, reporting this content. Um, I strongly urge the, the California State Bar to take immediate action to investigate these allegations thoroughly and to hold those responsible accountable for their actions. The public deserves better, and Leo T. Wilson should resign immediately to prevent further contagion and erosion of public trust. Thank you for your attention. And I'll be talking with you shortly. Hopefully, we'll all be in the same courtroom at some point in the future. Thanks for your time. Mr. Prime, thank you for your comments. Any additional speakers for public comment? No, that is all. OK. We will move on to agenda item one, the chair's report. Want to welcome Trustee Knoll to the audit committee. It is wonderful to have you appointed to our committee. and. Looking forward to your participation. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Thank you. Let's see. Moving along to um, business item, agenda item number two, business. The annual financial statement audit pursuant to business and professions code section 6145A, including legal services trust fund report under business and professions code section 622. And um, it is in two part, one, the presentation by the independent auditors, and then two, review of financial statements, and then three, authorization for submission by staff to the legislature and the Supreme Court. And I am going to hand this to our CFO, Ms. Montoya Chico, and I believe she has Mr. Bullock that will be joining her today. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Um, Justin, is David in? Yeah, David Perhaps. and Gian are both there, and I'm promoting okay. them to panelists, and I think they finally went through, so okay. they should show up momentarily. I am here. <laughs> there you are. Great. Um, so, for uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, committee members. I want to do a quick introduction before I kick off the presentation. Um, there's a few people in here that I, I wanted to introduce. Uh, one, Coco. Coco Zhang, she's on here, she's our controller. Um, she's very, very heavily involved and uh, basically oversaw the, the uh, financial statement audit. So I brought her on in case there's questions that she can help me answer. Um, and of course, I wanted to introduce you to uh, David Bullock, who's the audit partner at MGO, and he obviously oversees the entire um, audit on the, uh, the MGO side. And then his senior manager, Gian Shim. So she also um, has heavy, heavy involvement in the audit. 
So I'm going to have a presentation and I'm going to share my screen. So if you could please let me know uh, once you see it correctly, I would appreciate it. We see it. Yep. But, okay. So I'll I'll just give a little bit of overview of what my presentation will entail, um, and then before so I'll kick it off as I said, and then I will pass it over to uh, David Bullock uh, so he can present his his portion of the presentation. So I'll start going really high level um, through the audit reports um, that are going to be covered that are part of the 2022 audit. Um, our financial results uh, discuss about some of the high level items numbers wise that are going to be a few slides down. Um, obviously discussion on, on the required communications that the auditors are required to do. Um, the, the auditors are required to make to those charged with governance, which in this case is the audit committee, and that will be um, handled by David Bullock, as I mentioned. So first, a little bit of background on, give me a second, okay. here we go. Uh, a little bit of background on um, the audit. The audit committee is responsible. Um, it, it's in the audit committee charter. They do have responsibility uh, to appoint anything having to do with the audit, so appointing external auditors, reviewing and approving the annual audit scope, uh, and of course, evaluating the results, findings, and recommendations of the financial statement audits, which is the main purpose of this meeting. Um, we do have a statutory deadline to submit our financial statement audits by April 30th. Um, we obviously work, uh, we work, you know, Coco and, and the team work to prepare um, everything having to do with the financial statement audits. And our reporting period is, is our fiscal year, which it runs from January 1st to December uh, 2022. Um, so these are the four reports that um, are covered in our 2022 audited financials. Uh, the first one being the annual um, financial statements, which includes the independence auditor report. And that's just basically the review of the actual finance, the balance sheet and the income statement, which cover the entire year. Um, the second report that's included um, or the NGO worked on was the Legal Services Trust Fund Report. Um, and this is in accordance with the provisions in the Business and Professionals Code that you see on your screen. And this is basically to ensure that the distribution of IOLTA funds are going to qualify legal services projects and legal support centers. Um, the next report, the statement of um, statement of expenditure of mandatory fees, um, that's in compliance with the Keller standard. And that report, um, or that audit, if you will, basically uh, looks into the fact that mandatory fees cannot be used um, for any political or ideolo ideological activities that are not regulate related excuse me, to the regulation. So that's what that report covers. And then finally, uh, the report to the audit committee. Um, which is to those charged with governments. So here I'm going to show you very, very high level um, kind of where we ended on the balance sheet and the next slide is the income statement. This is not all inclusive. It's just uh, I'm highlighting the biggest changes that um, are in the balance sheet and the income statements. Um, so as you can see, our total assets um, increased from prior year. And the biggest portion of that is our cash and investments. Um, in our capital assets. Our cash and investments uh, increased, and that's really mainly due to um, additional, um, additional and larger grants uh, that we're getting. Um, some of the grants are paid in advance, so obviously they get put into our cash. Um, we do have more investments that we did purchase. Um, so in comparison, in comparison, excuse me, to prior year. So that's, that's really the, the biggest change in our cash and investments from prior year. Um, our capital assets are decreasing. You know, there's a lot of, uh, or it's mainly due to uh, some small additions, but it's also being offset by the depreciation that happens in, in our capital assets. Um, on the liability side, you see our liabilities increased uh, about 65 million from last year. Uh, these are the biggest categories, uh, under and fees. Um, that that account is basically due to again grants received in advance when we receive grants in advance we we record what is for future years in our unearned fees account and that's mainly for hp3 and the cal hfa grant that was received in 2022 and those are multi-year grants um, loans payable um, that that's decreasing and that's really just our, our annual or semi-annual payments that we make every year um, the net pension liability, you'll see that it's a pretty significant increase from prior year of about 60 million. Um, I don't have them all highlighted here, but anything relating to our OPEB or pension accounts, 
These are all the accounts that are determined on an an, uh, annually by actuarial valuations uh, that have a defined measurement period. Um, and the actual results of the trust obviously impact uh, all of the pension and and OPEB, other, other post-employment benefit accounts that you see in the, that you saw in the financial statements. Um, and specific to, oh, and, and those are, as I said, based on various assumptions. And we record the change of those accounts once a year in December, which is when we get the results from either our actuary or the valuation report from CalPERS on the pension, uh, on the pension trust. Um, and specific uh, to the net pension liability, uh, it's it's largely due to an investment loss that was incurred in the current year, whereas in prior year there was a significant offset um, to the change in assumptions. Um, in addition to uh, CalPERS had an interest rate reduction compared to prior year, so those two were the main factors that that cost the net pension liability. Um, to, to increase significantly from prior year. And again, that's not something that we necessarily have control over. It's just how the plan, uh, the pension plan functions um, and CalPERS obviously is the one who runs or, or manages that plan. We just record the impact uh, based on what we get. Um, one item I wanted to highlight here is the deferred inflows of resources. And I, I really, what I really wanted to highlight is this year in 2022, a pretty significant, uh, Le uh, lease standard was effective. Uh, it was regarding leases and what that standard basically did is we, we typically just recorded leases on the income statement, uh, but this new standard basically created or required, I should say, us to bring the any leases we have where we are the lessor or the lessee into the balance sheet. So now we have, if you saw if you on the financial statements on the balance sheet, we have where we are the lessor, um, we have leased assets, right of use assets and, and lease liabilities. Um, so that is a pretty significant change in the accounting industry that became effective for us this year. Um, so I wanted to highlight that. Uh, moving on to the income statement, uh, our revenues are increasing and really it's, it's, if, it's it, as you can tell, primarily driven by our grant revenues, we are getting more, um, more grants and larger grants. So that's really driven uh, the majority of the increase in, in what you see here as our revenues. Um, we did get uh, license fees and donations are slightly higher than last year. So we did have a little bit of an increase there. Um, the, another huge, pretty significant change is the trust account revenue. That obviously comes from uh, the interest rates that have actually been increasing since uh, probably the, la the last quarter of 2022 fees interest rates, I should say, have been increasing much better than they have been before and they've continued to into this year. So that impacts the trust account revenue since the deposits mm -hmm. become larger, the related interest also is, is gonna be larger. Um, the unallocated pension gain, similar explanation. Last year we had a gain of 15 million. Now it's a smaller gain of uh, 432,000. In prior years though, this actually used to be an expense. Um, so I did want to highlight the, the decrease in, in the gain, but, you know, for the prior prior years outside of 2021 and 2022, this had actually been an expense. And again, it has to do with how the plan, uh, the pension plan, uh, the change in assumptions and how it performs. Uh, not that we have much uh, control over that, as I mentioned in my prior slide. On the expenses side, we do have increasing expenses as well. Um, here I have uh, the Chief Trial Council, so OCTC. That increase in expenses is primarily just hire, we hired additional um, personnel into OCTC. So um, they have additional, mostly, mostly driven by those additional um, uh, personnel expenses. On the grant side, as I mentioned on the revenue, most of our grants are passed through. So the more grant revenue we get means the more grant expenses we're gonna have. Um, and finally, for admissions, uh, we went back to in-person exams, so it is costing us more to administer the exam in person, and that's that's really what's causing our increase um, in expenses and admissions year over year. Um, what else? The net position, just high level, it's basically you know represents the excess of revenues over over expenses for the various programs. So I will now. Uh, Unless somebody wants to ask any questions now or later on the, on the numbers, I will pass it over to uh, David Bullock for his presentation from MGO. Okay, great. Thanks, Araceli. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, nice to see you. Um, 
So we, we met earlier in the year, um, actually it was in November, um, going over the planning and I presented this slide. So it might look familiar to you if you were at last year's or in November at the November meeting. Uh, but I like just to restate it so that you have an opportunity to, to take a look, um, take a look at, at uh, the results of the audit and, and, and our responsibilities and communicating that. So th this is just a, a chart that we like to use to, to quickly give a snapshot of generally accepted auditing standards. And so we've completed our audit under our professional standards. Um, the purpose is to express an opinion on whether the whether or not the financial statements are, are fairly stated. And, and so um, and, and so that's the goal of a financial audit. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, internal controls in a later slide, but um, the internal controls that we've looked at, you know, relate to those controls that we think are necessary to ensure that the financial statements are fairly stated. So those internal controls related, related to really recording transactions and presenting information. Um, and we don't look at internal controls for the purpose of providing assurance on internal controls. We don't express an opinion as to the effectiveness of internal controls, but we do look at internal controls. And this year we took a deeper dive on the internal controls, which I'll talk about also at a later slide. And the results of the audit are then communicated um, you know, in, in the form of an audit opinion or in the form of findings. If we see uh, any matters that we think um, are important to you and your role as the governing body, um, and specifically the audit committee is, is being charged with that oversight role, uh, we'll communicate those matters to you. And what we communicate are matters that rise to the level of a significant deficiency or a material weakness in internal controls or non-compliance that's material to the financial statements. So those are our responsibilities to you. On the next slide, On the next slide, what we're, what we're reporting on today really are those required reports that are mandated um, by the end of April. And so State Bar has to abide by this mandated uh, deadline. There are other deliverables. So I'm going to focus on these first. So what we're presenting today is the annual audit. Um, it's a two-year audit. So in a two-year audit, it's a presentation that takes the current year, this, uh, December 31, 2022, and also um, the prior year as a comparative so that you can see how things change from the previous year. Um, one of the big changes, and, and this is important, one of the big changes is State Bar received federal assistance. And in doing so, you've taken on the responsibility of reporting within the federal guidelines, okay? And so what that requires from your auditor is to follow government auditing standards. And so it's a second uh, a second layer, if you will, of audit standards. And so um, while all, all auditors are, that do audits um, report under generally accepted auditing standards, government auditing standards as another layer of responsibilities. And, and most of those responsibilities come in the form of auditor independence, you know, ensuring that we're independent of the, um, of the organization that we're auditing and, that, and therefore providing an unbiased opinion. And, and the other, um, requirement that's significant under government auditing standards is that we communicate internal controls and compliance related matters uh, and make it uh, maybe a little more transparent than than just in the um, than in just the uh, reports to the board of government you know the governing body and so you're going to see um, a little more transparency on on communicating internal controls and compliance and we'll uh, so we issued a separate letter, an independent auditor's report under government auditing standards, and it, that should be part of your reporting package. And in there, we reported um, two significant deficiencies, and, and we'll talk about that uh, on a later slide. And so th those two reports, the independent auditor's report is basically our opinion, and that, that's the first page, page one, if you will, of the annual report. And then the second report we issued is a separately issued report um, under its own cover. The... Um, the single audit, which is the audit of the federal assistance, will also incorporate that report. But that the single audit is not ready yet; it'll come later. And so um, the report isn't complete if you don't have this this independent auditor's report under government auditing standards. And since you have to submit it to the legislature by end of the month, um, then we we issued this separate letter so your reporting package can be complete when you submit that. the uh, The second bullet there. Um, Actually, I guess it's the third bullet. Uh, the other one's kind of a sub-bullet. 
uh, is the examination report under the mandatory fees. And so um, that's the second report issue. The third report is the Legal Services Trust. Uh, issued a separate report on that activity. And then finally, a report to you, those charged with governance, really summarizing the results of the audit. So those are the four re um, reports uh, that have been issued. And then if you don't mind going to the next slide, there, there's two other deliverables that we have um, planned to be issued. Uh, the, 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 the second bullet there, the June, I'm gonna start with that first because I've already mentioned it. So the single audit is the audit of federal uh, assistance. And so State Bar received more than $750,000 uh, or incurred expenditures of more than $750,000 and therefore is required to have an audit performed on its um, use of those federal monies. That report is due nine months after year end. So it's not due until September, uh, but we plan on doing that um, in the next within the next two months. So by the end of June, we anticipate issuing that report uh, and the reason that's not done now is because, you know, we had to focus on the financial statement audit and this mandatory deadline of the end of April. And, and we've discussed in the past that that's a pretty stringent timeline. And giving four months after year end for a large government is not easy. Most governments have six months after year end. State bar has to abide by a, a four month mandatory deadline. And so that puts a lot of stress on finance to um, close the books and, and, and for us to get through the audit. and that short four month period. And so we have to prioritize and we prioritize the financial statement audit first. Uh, and then uh, now that we've met that deadline, uh, once we've issued today, um, we'll, we'll focus on the single audit. And uh, so I don't have anything to report to you at this time, other than, you know, we, we with the single audit report, we issued two independent auditors reports, one under government auditing standards, which is the one I just discussed that we is we're issuing separately so that you can file timely your April deadline. But that report will be repeated in the single audit report, along with the compliance audit on the federal spending. Okay, so that'll come in June. Uh, the the first bullet on this um, on this slide is the management letter. Now we we always issue the report to those charged with governance. Okay, and that was the report to the board, um, and that summarizes the audit and also includes required communications. Um, what we may from time to time issue is a management letter and and. Most auditors, you know, since we have to issue the, the report to the board, most auditors uh, don't find a need to issue a separate management letter unless there's other communications that, that um, the auditor wants to make that didn't rise to the level of a, of a reportable matter, okay? And so, um, and, and you may not be aware of this, but five years ago when State Bar went out for an RFP uh, request for proposals as part of the scope of services requested, was not only an audit, an annual audit for five years, but it was also a, a deeper dive, if you will, into the internal controls of State Bar. And, and uh, the request was that in the final year of the audit that we do um, an internal control assessment. Now, you know, we have to follow audit standards, as I've mentioned, and, and those standards have evolved over the years. And so, um, and so as auditors, we have to be careful about performing any kind of consulting services that can be construed as services that might impair our independence. And, and that would be things where um, we as your auditors are making management decisions or um, auditing our own work where we may be doing things and then turn around and opining on it. So we have to be very careful about the types of services that we accept when we're, um, when we're the auditors. And so um, and speaking with my compliance partner, we felt like we can continue uh, to meet the scope of services requested by doing the internal control evaluation, but not as a separate consulting engagement, but as part of the audit. There's nothing that precludes us as your auditors for taking a deeper dive and, and looking into the internal controls, okay? And so what we did is we expanded our scope to take a look at specific areas of internal controls that were requested. And, um, and we had some observations that we want to share with, with you. We've already been working with management as we've identified the issues and, and, I, and, and understanding, you know, whether or not there's mitigating controls or, or whatnot. So uh, we're about ready to share that with management, although we've been sharing the, the, the findings as we, as we identified them. Um, and that, that, that letter is going to come to your attention at the uh, May 18th meeting. Some of the findings relate to IT and they might be sensitive. 
you don't want to necessarily disclose your vulnerabilities to the public and then expose the state bar to, to uh, you know, unauthorized access or, or other things. So, so some, some of these findings are somewhat sensitive. And so, um, and so I believe that's going to be a closed session to, to, to share those, but th those will be shared. And, and I would say that anything that, um, that we deem to be significant or material, we were communicating through the audit. And so this letter is going to be, you know, a combination of housekeeping items and other items that we think would strengthen the internal controls at State Bar, but nothing that we could we, that we would consider to be real significant or, or material. Okay, so I just wanted to share that. So, so there there'll be two more meetings or at least two more deliverables, and and we definitely uh, uh, plan on attending the the uh, the May 18th meeting to share our observations and insights as we deliver the. The management letter, uh, whether or not we need to attend the the June meeting or or the, you know a subsequent meeting, maybe it's July um, on the single audit. We'll leave that to to your discretion. Uh, next slide, please. So, so one of the things that we're supposed to to let you know is whether or not the audit um, um, was uh, the results of the audit were uh, delivered in accordance with the planned audit timeline. And I'm, I'm here to affirm that it was. You know, we had intended to to do our field work in, in, in March and April um, and complete the reporting and presentation in, in by the end of April. And so um, so the audit uh, was completed in accordance with the plan timeline. So I'm happy to report that. Next slide, please. And so here's our required communications. And these are summarized in the report to the board. So um, we have that in writing and, and, and presented to you. Um, the, um, in, in order to meet the timeline of, of this meeting, we had to present drafts of everything as of Monday, I believe it was. And, and so there might be um, some updates and, and final language in, in the issued reports. Uh, but basically, it's going to follow this results section. So in the planning side, those required communications with you as the audit committee, uh, we did that back in November, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we, we, we talked about the auditor's responsibilities, and I showed that chart, and also the plan, scope, and timing of the audit. So that was all communicated back at the November 17th meeting. Um, so today, we're delivering the results. Um, and, and it's also in writing, but you know, we talk about the qualitative aspects, and that's important because if there's changes in the financial statements, you would not, you would want to know about it. And so we include in there anytime there's an implementation of new standards, and you did have new standards that were impactful this year. Uh, you're, uh, the state bar is required to recognize lease receivables and lease liabilities in the financial statements. You own two significant properties, so leases. Uh, to your tenants is a, is a is a material part of your organization. That's just uh, part of your operations, and so um, State Bar had to implement those two those standards that affected your financial statements. We also include the estimates that are made. You know, you know, financial reporting is a process that also includes estimates, and it's an important process because you can't wait um, two or three years down the road till things are finalized to say these are our numbers. You've got to close your books in a reasonable period of time and provide you know, uh, timely information is, is a, a really key part of, you know, quality financial reporting. And so in order to do so, you have to make estimates. And, and so we've highlighted some of the estimates that are in your financial statements so that you're aware of them. You know, RSLA talked about the pension standards and, you know, that's a big estimate. You have an actuary that goes through and kind of projects out what they believe the pension uh, benefits are gonna be in the future, but that's, they don't have a crystal ball. It's just a, a guesstimate. And every year that number is going to change as employment changes, as, as all of different assumptions uh, are, are affected by, by changes, longevity or, or salary increases. There's a lot of things that go into that estimate. It's going to change from year to year. And then investment results are also a big factor in that. So, so estimates is a big part of financial reporting. We want to make you aware of that. And then the rest of the bullets really identify areas that may have been an issue during the audit. And so we're happy to report that I think our audit um, – uh, went as planned. We, we feel like the audit went efficiently. Staff was very cooperative in providing information to us. So all in all, we felt like it was a very successful audit. There was no negative reporting in terms of um, any difficulties or any disagreements or any other matters like that. So the audit went well. And some of the bullets here are just informational items.
And just so you're aware of, of management made representations to us that they provided our, you know, the information to us um, uh, timely and they were forthcoming with, with the information. So um, nothing really uh, significant to report in that regard. On the next slide, I'm just summarizing here what I think RSLA may have mentioned, but we've provided unmodified opinions, uh, which is the highest level of assurance we can provide as auditors. And basically what that means is that we agreed with the presentation of the financial statements. Um, and for the, uh, the compliance audits, we looked at the Keller, the activity, the chargeable costs um, that were charged to mandatory fees and, and uh, saw no non-compliance there. Same thing with the legal services trust. We looked at the compliance there. So uh, we didn't have to modify our opinion. We, we, uh, we agreed with how um, the presentation was made. And then finally, on the last slide, oh, excuse me, there's two more slides. Uh, this is just a quick summary. You know, we, we talked about leases. That's the first bullet on the top there. Uh, that was really the only significant standard uh, for State Bar this year in 2022. But, but GASB is busy. They're always coming up with new standards. They're always evaluating financial reporting and making sure it's keeping up with the times. And so um, there's there's projects that are in process now that are going to be standards uh, down the road. So it seems like every year they're issuing three to four standards. So um, there are several standards that'll have to be looked at and implemented in the future. Uh, State Bar is evaluating the significance of those. I would say probably 96, GASB 96, which is recognizing a liability for long-term subscriptions for IT arrangements. That, that could be significant. Uh, the rest of these are, are not really that significant to State Bar. And then finally, in the last slide, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that um, that we have to um, that we've included uh, government auditing standards as, as part of the audit process, and because of that, we have to report in that in, in our letter um, any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses uh, that were identified during the audit. And there were two; they were both IT related. Um, one had to do with I think. Uh, just the overall IT program and, and addressing certain areas that are of significance that should be documented and, and should be monitored on an annual basis. And then IT access. And so there was two areas um, that we thought um, those rose to the level of reportable matters. And we included those findings in the uh, government auditing standards report. Um, and then, but in the, um, but in the, um, Report to the board, we uh, also provided, provided an update on uh, last year's reportable matter that we included. And that was more on, on finance and, and, and the, the closing process. And, and we believe that's been corrected. And, and that was really determined based on this year's audit and the fact that um, it, the, the closing of the books was much more successful by the, by the finance team. And with that, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Trustee Knoll. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Bullock, for uh, a very thorough report. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> However, uh, are you, you're saying that uh, at the May board meeting, you're going to provide us with more detail on the I, IT issues? Yeah, we're, we, uh, yes. On the, at the May meeting, we're going to provide a management letter. And that management letter is going to have more details in it about the internal control work that was performed during the year. The, the significant deficiencies that we reported, and there were two, and they were IT related, you know, th th those stand on their own. And, and, and those are uh, presented in the audit because you know, we're obligated um, under our professional standards to report that. Okay. Um, but but they're, not, they're not detailed at a, to a level where you, a reader can just read it and understand exactly what the issue is, you know, where the issues, um, you know, where, where the vulnerabilities are. So that, that, that level of detail is going to be more of a, a internal, internally shared document that, that you can see a little more information in that regard. All right. Thank you. Um, I, I do have one uh, other question that's a little more, I guess, 
personal, but um, I'm interested in your firm's logo. Okay. And the fact that it is a new type of firm and that somebody wrote underneath the initials of your firm, uh, type atypical. Oh, right. What does that mean? Um, yeah, that, I probably should have changed. That, that's our old branding, but- um, <laughs> Oh, but we, we, we're not just, atypical anymore. Well, we may still be atypical, but uh, <laughs> we're just not promoting that as much. You know, we've, we've gone through uh, several branding uh, um, uh, marketing efforts, campaigns, if you will, over the years. And, and you know, we're a full service CPA firm. We don't just do governmental audits, although that's the industry that I serve. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have people that do tax, business management, consulting. And so everyone has their opinion of, of how we should be, you know, branding our <laughs> And, and so, you know, we're just in another phase. And so, uh, but yeah, I think that is, you know, we as auditors are, are always willing to go be above and beyond. And it's not your, your typical accounting firm. Thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> Appreciate it. Any additional questions, Mr. Tony? There we go. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Shelby, and thank you, David, for the presentation. Um, you know, what's interesting is for people who may not be familiar with reading um, financial statements, this is easy to look, look at the um you know to to look at this and look at say page 20 that has um a total operating revenues of 295 um million and a operating expenses of 290 and this is because everything's put together here and then you look at you know you know, non-operating revenues, expenses, change in that, you know, net position beginning and net position at the end of the year, and you have a bottom line of 114 million. And somebody can look at that and say, well, the state bar is doing pretty good. Why is it complaining about um, the, um, the, uh, the, the attorney fees? And in order to really understand that, you have to go down to page 72. And because on page 72, I have to scroll through it to get through it. So give me a second. It's it's hard to like, uh, I, I didn't print it out on paper. Okay, so on page 72 is where you really look at the general fund, you know, and you know, these different funds, particularly with the legal services fund being so large, you know, they're funds that you can't commingle. You know, they gotta be completely separated, right? All these different accounts have to be absolutely separate. And so this is where um, we have total operating revenues of 89 million, operating expenses of 103 million, and an operating income and loss of 14 million, loss, right? And so I'm just, you know, what, what I wish, and I don't know what you can do at this late point because it's the 28th, I understand it's due to 30th, but it's the first time we've met and I've had a chance to really look at this. I wish there was a way that that could be moved up a little bit because um, from, in terms of messaging and communications, um, not everybody's gonna get down the page. Well, I, at the bottom of the page it says 62 if it's printed out but not everybody gets to page 62 of a report like this. Right. So this I, I, is just a comment, David, that I'm trying to uh, provide to you in terms of what, I'm not asking you to restate anything or change anything, but if there was a way that you could consider a quick cut and paste in order that's, that's still legitimate and not misleading, I'm just throwing out my, my feedback to you. Yeah, real quick on that. So I, I definitely understand where you're coming from. 
and, and unfortunately, we, we can't shift around the supplementary information and the audited information. But what I would say is this, and I think you point, I don't have your page numbers, but you pointed out where you saw the 114 million on what, page 20? Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at the page before that, page 19. Okay. Um, take a quick look at that. I will, just, I will. Thank you. Let me just point out. Because the financial statements are, there's really three statements you should be looking at. Mm -hmm. Statement of net position, the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in that position, which you just referred to, and then the cash flow statement. But the very first statement on the previous page, yes. um, you'll see at the bottom there, net position, and the three components of net position. And, and if you look at it, you'll actually observe there's an, a negative, a deficit unrestricted balance because the 114 million is made up of a building, right? 75 million in capital assets that, you know, you, you can't look, unless you sold your building, you don't have that. Right. That, those assets, right? And then another 85 million in, in restricted funds. So these are funds um, that have to be used for a specific purpose. That aren't not, they're not available to pay right. salaries or pay, pay, you know, they're having Primarily pay, the grant. Either their grant restriction. Right. And so you can't really spend those funds because you have to kind of segregate. And that's where those schedules that you were looking at in the back really help out, because that really helps you understand, you know, what are all the different programs right. at State Bar and how do we have to keep all of these different activities isolated? This is helpful. So, thank you. Thank, sure. thank you, David. I mean, I'm, it's, a, it's a lot and I'm doing my best to really understand sure. it. So thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Mark, are you, are you saying that, you know, I, I'm, I'm following what you're saying and I'm, 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 are you saying the benefit of articulating this in an executive summary so people have an understanding of what our financials are really looking like? Is that you, what you're saying you, as you it relates that, to the legislature? That, you know, that, if it were possible, I think that would be a... A, a, a valuable thing, and 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 I'm talking about a three or four pager at at, at, at the most um, could be useful if, if it were possible, David. You know, it, it's you know I understand the time frame, and it's you know you know you, I, I'm sure you worked up into the wire to get this done. I I, I appreciate that Edda Sally had to work up into the wire to get everything done, um, so I, I I am appreciative of that. Um, I just, um, you know, it's it, it's just hard when we're in this situation of, you know, spending a little time looking at this the last few days ourselves, or at least, you know, myself, and then trying to figure out what, you know, I, I mean, for us, this is a public document, obviously it's public, but it has value as more than just we complied with the law, but this this is a political document, quite frankly. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that um, that you might be able to accomplish something to that effect with it if you included a transmittal letter with the reporting package. Wow. The the report itself, um, at least the the basic structure of it, really is not going to allow you to make those kinds of comments. Um, but you could always include, you know, it'd be it'd be outside of the audit, but there could be a transmittal letter that's within the document. Okay. Where it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the you know state bar transmitting this document to to whomever legislature or to just the general reader, but there there could be a you know, chance to do it. obviously not this year because we're we're ready to issue this report, and then I and the, just unfortunately with the timing, I don't think we're ever going to get to the point with the existing mandated deadline where you're going to have. The kind of time you're talking about to really put your thought into a, the document, have a chance to read it, and then have a chance to have a dialogue before man, you know, the mandated deadline. So what I would suggest uh, maybe going forward is to utilize the planning meeting that was done, say this year is done in, in November of 22, mm -hmm. to, to, to look at the previous year's issued report. So that would be this report and say, how can we make improvements and, and, and have that discussion at the, at the front of the engagement? And, and that way, by the time we get to the end, it's meeting your expectations. Because unfortunately, we just have not have enough time to, to go through that whole process before the, the deadline. I, 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 
appreciate that. And I'm going to hold off just so you know, I have one other comment, but I- uh, Mark, um, may I interrupt you really quickly? So I, I wanted to I wanted to clarify also um, the financial statement results versus what we presented in the budget. Um, they're, they're not apples to apples, and that's because the financial statements are under U.S. GAAP. So there's a lot of accounting entries mm -hmm. that we do. So depreciation, right? It, it, it's there, We don't budget for depreciation because we're not actually paying money for it. Um, all of the lease standards, uh, sorry, all of the lease entries uh, that we did as a result of GASP, the implementation of the GASP 87, mm -hmm. um, we do account for anywhere where we have cash uh, outflows in, in the budget, but the balance sheet really it's all, uh, we account for it on the budget side, but these financial statements are now adjusted to present it now on the, on the balance sheet side, and we kind of adjust it out of the income statement. So there's a few of those. There's um, our accruals, right, for uh, sick and vacation. Those are just our estimates as of year end of what we think our liability could be, but did we actually pay those amounts? No. So th there are a few of those adjustments that we have to make for financial statement presentation purposes that are not reflected in the adopted budgets we have. Um, it, it, you know, it is true the 2023 budget, if which I think is what probably um, a lot of the people want to see because it's how much we're actually spending or how much we're earning in revenues. Um, so I would, I, I don't, we, I don't, we could consider putting maybe something in the cover page that goes to the legislature, but I just want to make, you know, the, the clarification that the financial statements are prepared differently from what the budget, um, adopted budget does say. Thank you. Thank you. You know, that, that is helpful. Ms. Wilson, can you weigh in? Um, because I, I think I know where Mark is trying to go as it, and I understand we're looking at a snapshot in time as it relates to the audit that we are moving forward today. But, you know, as we talk about narrative and making sure that everyone has the same narrative as it relates to being underfunded for the things that we need to do. Um, I don't know. I'd be interested in your thoughts. Um, I think my thought is that the budget document, which we do submit to the legislature, is a better vehicle for that kind of messaging. Because of what Araceli mentioned, there are so many accounting adjustments here, and it does not match our budget, that trying to, to sort of align or explain or use it as part of our narrative, I fear overly complicates things. There are also wild swings based on the accounting standards changes and the CalPERS, the OPEP valuation issues. So I don't think the, the audit itself is a great vehicle for that messaging. That being said, the fact that we have a clean audit mm -hmm. and I wanna give Araceli and Coco and her, the team recognition for the fact that they addressed the, the material finding from last year and there are no material findings. Um, I think that reinforces a message of financial responsibility. And that aligns with the recent state auditor saying we need a fee increase and in looking at our financials. So I think it's true we can package this as part of an overall narrative, but I'm not sure it's part of the, you know, look at these numbers and they help explain our, our financial condition because I think it does not align with the budget very well at all. So it sounds like that narrative would be better well served as it relates to our legislative outreach. Exactly. And tying all of those pieces together. Exactly. That's my view. Thank you. Mr. Tony, I think you had another question. Yes, but I wanted to take it up after we have a vote on this because it's a it's a follow up. Okay. Any other questions by any of the committee members? And uh, Ms. Wilson, thank you for pointing that out. I, I um, The fact that we do not have any material weaknesses, congratulations to our team, um, to our CFO and to um, Coco, it's wonderful meeting you. This is the first opportunity and also to Mr. Ewart. And so it's wonderful to be able to, to say that. And I love the idea of, of weaving the narrative together as we move forward. And, and most of you do know, as it relates to our legislative package, there is conversation inside of there of receiving. Uh, Mr. Bullock talked about this in terms of receiving additional time 
And I'm confident that the um, finance team would agree with that. Just getting a couple more months to be able to close the books and then again, turn around and audit as clean as this. So that being said, if there's not anything else that needs to be reported, Ms. Montoya, uh, Chico, anything else that you would like to share? Um, no, no, that's, that's all I have to share. So thank you, Melanie. No, thank you. So I believe there's a resolution. I would like to move the, revo the, the resolution. Mr. Tony would like to move the resolution. Is there a second? I'll second. That sounds like Ms. Chen with the second. And Mr. Ewart, if you could call the roll, please. Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. No. Uh, I approve the resolution, except that I must recuse myself from any decision with respect to the parts of the audit that include the legal services trust fund uh, due to a personal financial interest. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Noll. Shelby? Aye. Tony? Aye. That's 540 against. The resolution passes. Thank you. Let's see. And also, I want to say thank you to the, the, the finance team. I know last year when we were having this conversation, we were looking at an initial draft, and it's wonderful to be able to look at the draft that's actually going to be submitted to the legislature. So I, I did not want to go let that go unnoticed. So thank you very much for that. I think, Mr. Tony, you had um, a comment or a question that you wanted to pose at this time. And the question is just asking about a procedural question. I don't know whether, um, you know, who, who would respond to this, but um, being that uh, David um, um, explained in his presentation that this is year five of the five-year contract, um, I was curious what the process is for issuing an RFP um for uh the next contract so i i can take that um i'm mm. actually working on that as we speak um, i've started the process already um with general services who kind of gets the process initiated for us so so yes we do have to do uh, an rfp this year uh, for the next audit contract um eventually the audit committee needs to approve that so uh, that has that has started and is in prog in the beginning stages, but but I have started that process um, for the RFP for the next uh, the next five years of our auditors. Thank you very much. You've answered my question completely. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any additional questions? That being said, I don't believe we need to adjourn the meeting. So just want to thank everyone for their time. And I believe that is it for the day. Is that correct, Mr. Ewart? That is correct. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.